Uh, this is Senate Appropriations Committee, and we're still working on the budget adjustment for the fiscal year. Um, and so uh, we are going to be taking testimony from uh, the Vermont State College Chancellor and uh, staff. Um, we are, I noticed that you have quite a lengthy submission. Uh, I think it's like 25 pages of information. So um, our focus today is only on the budget adjustment. I realize that um, uh, you'll be back for the big bill, but um, uh, if you would uh, uh, just uh, explain what's being requested here um, and how it will sort of segue into maybe your budget request that we'll take up in greater detail later on. That would be great. And I see you have Sharon Scott with you and Catherine Lavasser. So um, uh, Chancellor, if you wanna start or however you wanna present this, um, uh, we will proceed. Yes, no, I, I really appreciate all of you uh, meeting with us today um, and thank you very much for the opportunity um, to speak with you and give you an update on the system and also uh, the potential CRF funds in the FY21 Budget Adjustment Act. So um, as you know, we, we do have a new leadership team. So for the record, I'm Sophie Zidatny. I'm Chancellor of the Vermont State College System. And with me today is Sharon Scott, our Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer as well as Catherine uh, Lavasser, our Director of External and Governmental Affairs. Um, so I, I, I hear what, you, um, what you're saying. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out here how much to, to share with you. Um, I think the, the key points that we would like for you to take away today is that we do believe the Vermont State Colleges are key to Vermonters' success. Uh, we are in the middle of a significant transformation uh, that's being guided by the work of the um, Legislature Select Committee on the Future of Public Higher Education in Vermont. And we do recognize that it's, it's vital that we, we transform. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, you know, we've included in the packet, we have materials about the students that we serve, um, that we are across the state of Vermont. You know, we're within 25 miles of nearly every Vermonter. Uh, we have a heat map that shows that in the materials. Uh, we did want to emphasize that our students um, are not necessarily traditional middle-class students coming from stable families. Um, not all of our students have homes to go to and um, or can afford a residential four-year experience that we really are serving um, all Vermonters and not just um, those that you know one traditionally thinks of as, as uh, 18 to 22 year olds going to colleges. Um, this slide has some of the, the data on our students um, that's in the materials. So again, we do educate over 10,000 students a year and, and most importantly, 83% of our students are Vermonters. Uh, we do educate more Vermonters than all other institutions of higher education in the state combined. And about two thirds of our alumni live and work here in Vermont. Um, so we, uh, you know, we strive to um, educate, you know, we have 3,300 first generation college students. We have about 3,000 low income undergraduate students. We provide pathways to affordable certificates, degrees, credentials, um, and seek to provide economic stability in the rural regions of the state where we're located. Um, as a system, we employ nearly 3,800 people and our employees live in every county of the state, as you can see on this slide. Uh, we are among the largest employers in the state uh, next to the state of Vermont. University of Vermont, the state's largest hospitals and some of the, the larger businesses. Uh, regionally, we also stack up as a large employer and do employ hundreds of Vermonters in our anchor communities. So we offer competitive wages and benefits and um, we also provide employment for Vermonters of all educational attainment levels. Um, our top enrolled programs align very well with Vermont's workforce needs. Uh, for mental health professionals, childcare providers, entrepreneurs, educators, healthcare professionals, and more. And so, um, again, understanding why we're so important to the state of Vermont, we do recognize um, the system faces significant challenges if it's going to continue to meet the needs of Vermont and its students into the future. Um, I know we've, we've testified before, and we can certainly um, discuss more next time uh, that we're in front of you, but some of the challenges facing us regarding the demographics and the market challenges. Um, we faced uh, this past semester, this past year, we had several campuses operating online only. 
uh, we've had a steep drop in enrollment and we've also had significant operating costs associated with the pandemic. Um, of course, we also had a structural deficit going into the pandemic. Uh, we've received significant bridge funding and CRF dollars from the legislature uh, for this FY21, for which we're extremely grateful. Uh, with that bridge funding, the legislature did create uh, a legislative select committee on the future of public higher education in Vermont. And that committee has been charged with assisting the state of Vermont to address the urgent needs of the Vermont State College system and to develop an integrated vision and plan for a high quality, affordable and workforce connected future for public higher education in the state. And as you likely know, on December 4th, the select committee released an initial report there is a, a second report that will be coming out on February 12th and a final report um, in the middle of April, April 16th. Uh, there are some main, the main recommendations in that report uh, relate to uh, a common accreditation for the three residential colleges, Vermont Technical College, Northern Vermont University and Castleton University. It also recommends aggressive administrative consolidations. Um, as well as a restructuring of our budget and um, steps that we need to take to reduce our structural deficit, plus recommending an increase in the base appropriation from the state and ongoing bridge funding. Um, so we're working with our board right now. Uh, we're in a listening phase. We've, we've um, had a couple of presentations to the board. We have another board meeting coming up on February 22nd. Right now we have approximately six weeks of public comment we're in the middle of that. Um, we have a link that we've provided on our website with materials and um, an opportunity for people to submit written comments. And our board will be holding a listening session uh, with uh, the public. Uh, so not only internal, but external stakeholders as well. And that's scheduled for February 17th. Um, so while we are um, continuing to plan for the future, we are also you know, undergoing significant transformation work um, as, as we go along and we're taking needed action um, at the time and we're, we're doing what we can to tr transform. Uh, we've been working in regular close communication with the speaker, the Senate pro tem and the governor. And we are looking to partner with the state leaders and the select committee and our board of trustees as we work to stabilize the system and build a better, stronger and more sustainable future for Vermont. Uh, with the transformation in mind, our Board of Trustees did recently adopt a set of strategic priorities and the strategic priorities are focused in four key areas, affordability, accessibility, quality of academic programs and relevance of programs. And we've defined each of those as to what success will look like. We've also embedded um, an intentional focus on diversity, equity and inclusion. And um, that's reflected in the board's recent revisions to its bylaws and trustee handbook, as well as its decision to create a board level committee on diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, we also just briefly want to thank you for the, for the work you've, um, and encouragement you've provided to us, um, including the bridge funding that we did receive for the FY21 budget regarding the workforce initiative. Uh, so I just want to quickly mention that um, we spent approximately 1.5 million of CRF dollars on the workforce initiative. It enabled us to serve 971 Vermonters, uh, taking almost 1400 courses across all four of our institutions. Um, the demand was very high that we filled up very, very quickly. We, we got to 971 very rapidly. We've had tremendous free feedback from students about the initiative, how it came at exactly the right time. It helped them change careers or upskill and uh, the value of the wraparound services that we provided. Uh, we so if you could ask a question um, and sure. other people. Um, the 971 Vermonters, obviously one of the uh, big challenges is enrollment and reaching out and also um, how, um, and these were people who obviously were unemployed and this was a, a, a workforce strategy. Um, do, you had, uh, do you have any sense of out of that almost thousand Vermonters, uh, how many this would have been their first encounter with the state college system? In other words, uh, have, uh, were they actually um, uh, maybe a, a, a new pipeline of Vermont adults um, 
uh, seeking the benefits of the, of the state college system. We, we just sent a survey out, I believe it was last week, and I'm pretty sure that was one of the questions that was included in it. Um, we've started getting some of the feedback on that, um, but we definitely, once we get that, we'll be happy to share more information with you. But I'm trying to remember, and Catherine may remember this better than I do, but I think when we were enrolling people, that was a question, and there it was a significant number of new people that were new to higher education. There were people that already had some credits or had, I mean, we had some people, for example, um, working through the Castleton Center for Schools, which was for teachers, uh, professional development. So that was at a much higher level. Um, obviously they have education, um, and, but it, it was the full range down to people doing, you know, much shorter term certificate programs. So it really covered a broad spectrum. Uh, we did ask that information though, so I'm quite sure we have it. I just don't have um, a number so I don't know, Catherine, do you have a number on that? Happy to follow up with that. I think we're still in the process of collecting all of the surveys back from the participants. Mm -hmm. All right, um, just um, um, very in interested to see uh, how, because um, that to me is a very good initiative to think about how we're connecting to a very different group maybe of students um, and workforce needs than um, might have occurred in the past. Um, so, okay, uh, other questions or I'll, I'll let the chancellor um, keep going. Uh, you do know that we have Senator Baruth now on our committee. So he's uh, providing some real good continuity between uh, the work underway and the committees and the uh, various studies. So um, he's very welcome I, addition to the can committee. I quote you on that? Um, for any particular <laughs> Purpose? Just every purpose, really. Oh, well, no, I, I think uh, this is this has just been such an important um, uh, discussion to, to have and really to um, focus on not only what is what is the role and the benefit of our state college system in a variety of ways. And um, and then um, uh, but like any system, um, we're taking what is sort of we've inherited and the question is how do we, um, uh, you use the term transform, but re-engineer, whatever you wanna call it, um, uh, to, um, to address the realities of today's needs. And certainly if there's an area that I've been harping on and that's nursing program and just the, uh, um, the resources that, but our limited capacity relative to that study that was done um, in terms of what we need as a state for um, that particular area of our healthcare workforce. So um, some of the areas that you really are strong all do li line up very well with um, where the future needs are, are, are well known and um, certainly um, that's one of them. So uh, unless there are other comments, we'll let the chancellor keep going. Yep. Anyway, a thousand students, that's not almost a thousand, that's... Um, well, it was, it was 971 students and we probably could have served, well, I'm, I'm sure we could have uh, enrolled more. One of the challenges we had was that we wanted to make sure we gave everybody a really good experience. Yeah. And because we were offering wraparound services, um, textbooks, childcare, transportation, um, it meant that it was, um, you know, it, we didn't want to over overcommit and then have people have a bad experience. So uh, we really focused on making sure that we provided people with the assistance they really needed. Um, so they got the best, um, the best experience in the hope that moving forward, they would see value in it and be willing to continue to invest in themselves and, and return to the Vermont State Colleges. And again, we did put that, set it up in, in, on a very, very short timeline. If we had more lead time, I think we could do a, even better um, a better job with it. But um, certainly the need was there and the word got out very, very quickly. Uh, there was a press conference on a Friday with um, President Joyce Judy of CCV with the governor. And by Monday, we were um, having to pull back on some of the marketing we were doing because we, we really couldn't accommodate taking more people. Mm -hmm. uh, we were sort of running out of instructors to set up additional section so well um, I deliberately rounded up to a thousand because a thousand just carries a different uh, I don't know sense of uh, of um, volume 
compared we, to nine. We were very close. It's mm -hmm. like that nine dollars and ninety nine cents um, uh, kind of approach. The other question is, um, out of the um, uh, Vermonters who enrolled, uh, was the completion rate with all the supports that you also referenced were being put in place? Was the uh, completion rate, success rate, um, one that you found um, uh, to be good, or were there, or did it identify some other areas of needs or supports? I don't, I don't believe so. I've not heard that. My sense is that it was successful that people got the support that they needed, and I know on the survey one of the questions was what support did you need? You know, what support did you take? Was there anything that you didn't receive that you needed? So. Um, the survey did include questions um, along with that. And uh, primarily, I think textbooks, technology assistance, um, childcare. Um, mm -hmm. Although I was surprised there wasn't as much childcare need as I had anticipated, but that may be because everyone's remote and the kids are at home and they've already adjusted mm -hmm. to that. I don't know. Catherine, you had a comment? I did. Um, one piece that stuck out to me in the preliminary results from the survey that we were able to gather so far is the um, sentiment that some participants didn't know where to start if they'd been laid off or were looking to career transition. Um, so if you're if you're talking about things that were unique or um, flags for the future, there was mm -hmm. a, a little bit of a sentiment of these courses are excellent, but I don't know which one I should go with if I'm oh. transitioning my career. Hmm. Okay. I think a lot of that has to do with the speed with which we launched and needed to make sure that the program's completed. So those are factors that can be mitigated if a new program were developed. Um, we, we launched and had students in classes within a very, very short period of time. Um, and while that's great, if you're already ready and you know exactly what you wish to do, it can be much more challenging when you are presented with a panoply of options and all of a sudden you you just need to make a choice because the, your option will be gone if you don't do so. Okay, thank you. I will turn it over to, um, if there aren't any more questions, but turn it over to Sharon to talk on the, the finance pieces. That's really why we're here. Yes, okay, thank Senator you. Senator Kitchell, would you like us to skip straight to our budget adjustment request or would you like a little bit more of background? Um, committee, do you need, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time with, with state colleges and uh, we have the um, report that has been issued um, um, around the recommended funding over a multi-year period of time. Um, but let me ask, um, committee, do you want any more background information or should we, we can go to the money and then we can open it up for more general discussion. Why don't we do it that way and then... Yeah. Um, then if uh, people should have to leave or whatever. But our focus, of course, is always um, finding the money. And um, absolutely, and in the um, interest of time. And we're committed to doing that, as I, I think that has been pretty obvious. I think um, all, all of a sudden, you know, we tend in, I would say, in the legislat legislative arena to look at. Um, uh, look uh, in sort of categorical or long committee lines, but I think um, the um, situation with the state college system brought home the reality that you can't look at just uh, the state college system within the context of higher education. It gets into social equity, it gets into economic development, it gets into workforce. And so it really does force a much larger discussion and a much uh, deeper appreciation of, of the role um, and the statewide presence of our state college system. So um, I, I guess we should start with the money. We know that um, the governor did uh, include some money uh, toward this year. Um, uh, I think it was 5 million in two different um, pieces. Um, and then uh, his 22 budget does include some additional money um, but I don't think it adds up to the amount that was suggested was needed in the report. So if you want to start with the money, um, and I guess Sharon, you'll do that uh, for us then. Um, we'll go yes. there and then we can have further discussion. 
Yes, so um, we'll begin just with the budget adjustment, um, since that is what you asked us here originally for. So um, a couple of weeks ago, the administration approached the Vermont State Colleges about whether we could use additional CRF money this year, uh, given the new deadline that was outlined by the federal, federal government on December 27th. Um, and you may recall that um, you uh, issued us a really gracious $22.758 million in CRF uh, as part of last year's cycle in Act 120. But unfortunately, we had to return $13.4 million of that back to you in October, and then another $640,000 at the beginning of December. And that was really because we um, were unable to use the money in the time frame allotted. Um, December 30th, 2020, was too short a time period. We have other expenses that we could use them on, but we could not do that given the guidelines. So for example, you couldn't purchase testing in advance. We knew we needed testing in the spring, but we couldn't purchase those testing uh, kits in the fall and have that be available for us in the spring. And so that tight timeline really forced us to be in a position where we needed to return those funds. Um, as we were thinking about it, we said, well, what could we do knowing the new guidelines, knowing that the spending can go through the end of December of 2021. So this is a calendar year request, not simply just an, an FY21 request. And we identified a series of projects that we could use CRF funds for through the end of the calendar year. And these projects included things that were a little bit more than $5 million, COVID testing for the fall and spring. So in the spring of this year, we anticipate that at minimum, our COVID testing, and this is what we've contracted for, is a little over $681,000. Now that's using the minimum standards and guidance that we have available to us right now. Um, and those guide, that guidance has been placed to us by the state. We do know that at the federal level, there is discussion right now about um, the bat return to school, return to higher education, and whether there may be additional standards placed upon us yet, we do not know. But that would be one thing that we're looking for. Increased cleaning and sanitation of our college buildings and facilities. Um, each of our residential institutions, so with the exception is the Community College of Vermont, because they are still fully remote, it's costing us about uh, $50,000 a semester to make sure that we're meeting the cleaning and sanitation standards that have been set before us um, by the state of Vermont and um, according to guidance from public health officials. Um, also, we have substantially diverted employees who are not performing their regular work, but are instead responding to the public health crisis. An example is um, uh, an athletic trainer who may be overseeing a portion of COVID testing or an administrative assistant who is not supporting faculty, but is instead now participating in remote advising sessions for students. We also um, need to provide additional sections due to social distancing. Um, so when we look at our uh, academic classrooms, typically they seat between 18 and 30 people. Um, it's not a 50% occupancy in most classroom spaces. It's generally um, um, less than 30 to 40% that we can see. So we have many classrooms where we can only seat seven students plus an instructor in a socially distant way. So we need to add extra sections for those things. Those are all activities that we need to pay for during this current fiscal year, as well as we're anticipating will need to be paid for in the next fiscal year in the first half. Um, and <clears throat> so the last thing um, is fall scholarships. So um, we know that many of our students, and we could see this from the CRF workforce development activity, that many of our students and many of the individuals in the state of Vermont have a great deal of need. And so um, we are proposing a, a specific scholarship that would help those students um, who they or their families have been negatively impacted by COVID. Um, Unfortunately, we can only use that money for the fall semester, but we do hope that that would allow students to be able to enroll in the fall, um, perhaps be able to postpone some of their aid and use that in the spring and, in, and be able to help them get through this. Um, and that we're estimating at about $900,000. And we hope that it will help somewhere between 750 and 900 students, depending on their level of need. 
So we really appreciate your willingness to have us here and um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, I have, um, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this that you're proposing here is being driven um, by uh, the CRF guidelines. And I believe, and Stephanie, you're listening, um, because the CRF money is becoming uh, overly subscribed, I believe the House may have used general fund. They did. And if they did, um, then general fund does not come with the same constraints. So my question to you is whether that list of needs, does that crosswalk with the 40 million that you said you would need um, in fiscal year 22? Um, and to what extent is it being driven by keeping within the CRF guidelines as opposed to where if you had general fund and greater flexibility, you would feel would be more effectively used? So um, for the, there's about $1.4 million of that that would be able to be used in the coming, the coming fiscal year, so in FY22. Um, so that $1.4 million is uh, included in our $45 million budget ask or $42.5 billion budget ask. So that would be inclusive there. Um, do we have many other needs? Absolutely. Um, but the remaining 3.6 million uh, or approximately 3.6 million of that is money that is necessary right now that is not included within the Vermont State College's budget. The colleges have been very, very careful with their money, um, holding positions open, making sure that they are being fiscally responsible, uh, really in many ways austerity measures to take care of um, making sure that we are um, having as much uh, money available for us to be able to assist with resolving our deficit. Um, but these are things that are extra to the budget that make things worse. Okay, so th that's very helpful. So the 3.6 million that you've identified needed now in no way helps you with that bridge funding um, need that you've identified. N not for FY22, that is correct. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, Senator Baruth. Uh, so I'm curious, and maybe it's, um, it's elsewhere or in, in different streams of money represented elsewhere, but when I think about, um, you know, the, the select committee's report, the, the pieces of it that make the most sense to me in terms of changing the equation are the unification of the system but what allows that to be transformative is this idea of ubiquitous course delivery uh, around the state so that someone who's enrolled at Castleton or, or NVU is not limited to the offerings there, but they have the other offerings. So I had been expecting to see at every level um, an attempt to use money to advance the technological side of the system, um, the online delivery system, uh, students technology, the individual campuses technology, getting everybody more um, firmly connected and increasing that sense of ubiquitous delivery. So Maybe you're I'm, into 22, Phil. Well, what I'm wondering is when the administration came to you for the budget adjustment, is there is there no way that you could use increased technology funds now that could help that later goal? Uh, there are absolutely ways that we could, uh, if we had increased funding now that was directly related to that transformative experience, we could absolutely use funds like that now. I will say that we were able to use a portion of the CRF dollars that you allocated to us last fall to assist us with remote delivery. So last fall and last spring. So our college campuses um, made massive upgrades over the summer, last summer and into the fall to increase its remote delivery capacity. That capacity extends not only um, to uh, delivery 
remotely from one classroom to a single student or multiple students, but it also allows for further delivery across college campuses. We have faculty today who, um, who are scheduling classes for the spring that are actually enrolling students at each of our individual campuses. And a couple of departments in specific that the chancellor can refer to, refer you to, that are really um, making tremendous inroads that way. Additionally, we have a USDA grant, um, a USDA Rural Development Grant um, that was recently authorized that's allowing the colleges to work um, uh, with mental health professionals to be able to make sure that we're offering further mental health capacity across the state. And um, so we are doing that, but there are many things that we could be doing today, given the funding, but um, we are still in the planning processes for some of those things. Though I, I know that our, our technology staff, who I spoke with yesterday, um, would be happy to pull a project together um, that addressed it immediately. And, and I guess that's what my question boils down to is in the same way that you've got in the budget adjustment, um, your testing um, needs, it, it seems to me that there, there must be some work that you're doing where we could direct uh, increased um, funding on the technology side, even without waiting to, to do it all in the in the big bill. So I just put certainly, that out there as a yeah, Certainly there is. We, um, with this particular ask, when we were working with the administration, it was under the expectation that all of the funds needed to be CRF eligible. That's why the narrow focus of the specific projects that are proposed here. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and that, I suppose that's back to the chair's point about general fund versus right. CRF. Yeah. Okay, and, thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, are there, um, mm -hmm. Uh, question is how much, which is budget adjustment um, within the budget adjustment context we deal with versus um, within the big bill itself um, for the overall funding. What was important is then um, is knowing that the 3.6 is really an add on to anything that was included as um, re required funding in, included in the report. It's, um, it's not, we can't subtract it and say we've made some progress. Uh, no, <laughs> not specifically, no. Okay. Um, it would address this year. Okay. Um, I did just wanna add one thing, um, you know, uh, Sharon just mentioned, but we do have faculty in both business and maths um, between Castleton and NVU that are, are using telepresence. So they'll be teaching in person on their home campus and at the same time, um, they'll be teaching students at the other institution um, via telepresence. So those students will be participating at the same time, but remotely. Uh, we also did use some of the CRF dollars to build a website, um, which now hosts all our online offerings, going to uh, Senator Baruth's um, interest in ubiquitous to make it much easier and transparent for students to find courses across the system. They always had the ability to take courses across our system. It was just very hard for them to figure out what was available and when it was available. Um, so we did use CRF dollars to um, build that website to make it much more easy for people to find courses across the system. Um, I guess I need to understand, um, Phil, I, um, if we're looking at what is being requested and linking it back to what's being proposed, um, when you're talking about investments now and to support the transformation or the um, courses being uh, uh, available in a uh, ubiquitous way, um, is that included in the estimates? Or are you doing some additional thinking about um, what is needed? That I, I believe that's included in what okay. the um, state colleges have said they need in the big bill. Okay. All right, um, I just wanted to be so, clear. So what I was wondering was, was there a way to, um, in the same way that the testing need started in March and continues unabated, and we're, we're dropping money in, in each bill to deal with it. I was wondering if, because I'm sure they, the technology spend has been going on unabated as well. So um, I guess, it doesn't really matter if we if we provide the full 40 plus million in the big bill or if we moved part of it out here but um i just wanted to 
make it clear that uh, as far as I can see, that's you know not just providing the courses, but making them easily transferable, making sure that each major is available wherever you are. Um, those things are key to the to the kind of unified system we've been talking about. So, yes. so I think for the committee, then it's um, delineating what we do in the bu in a budget adjustment mm -hmm. to make corrections to the FY twenty one budget versus what um, gets done in the uh, big bill and part of this much larger discussion um, that um, will occur between education committees and the fine. Uh, and the appropriations committee. Um, so I know. Um, so I know that there is some additional language about some uh, um, if other money becomes available. Stephanie, can you just clear? Uh, we're kind of getting into what the house did, but the uh, administration was proposing a total of five million, and I think some of it um, was a combination of what we have now. They thought with CRF, but of course. Um, uh, we might have spent that on something else like a uh, um, rental assistance. So can you just tell us what, uh, how the house carved the baby up here on this one? Sure. Stephanie? So that, so the, the, the governor had the 3.6 out of CRF and then if additional CRF was available and up to an additional 1.4 sort of the 5 million total, the house, I believe has simply appropriated 3.6 of general funds specifically for COVID related expenses. They did not have the second, you know, if additional, okay. they, they, did, they would just be dealing with general fund in the, in the FY22 budget. Okay. For so any um, additional. Okay. So what we have then coming over to us is dealing with the money that you need now. And um, obviously ho holding the longer conversation around what's, because it's some capital funding I think is also being requested in the in the report wasn't there some capital yes oh, okay as well as um so what we're doing now is making no uh, just additional uh costs because of COVID all right um and that's what the house did would there be um up to 1.4 if CRF, uh, do you see that that money would, uh, that, that your costs would be, well, it is, you outlined them were 5 million. So yes, absolutely. you've already done that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, and you know there are additional items that we did not include on here, recognizing that the pool of CRF dollars was likely limited. Um, and those would include uh, things like making upgrades to our HVAC systems. Um, they have a longer lead time and they're much more expensive uh, in terms of activities. Uh, it is work that if the pandemic is continuing uh, should be done um, and that the colleges do not have the money to be able to do so, but we did not include them on the list here. Now the recent uh, round of federal legislation did um, include funding for higher education. Um, yes, can you just tell us uh, from uh, the state college perspective, uh, what does, what does, how does that help and what does it, I mean, if it's all of higher education for everybody in the state of Vermont, it gets spread around pretty quickly. So Sophie, do you, or Sharon, can you tell us, do you have any sense of the financial relief that would come to the state college system from that latest um, bill? Yeah, so it's called HERF, H-E-E-R-F, and it's college specific. Uh, so we already have a sense for what the amounts are and it's approximately 12.3 million that would come directly to the individual colleges, wouldn't come to the chancellor's office, goes directly to the colleges. Uh, we would be required to, just as it happened in the spring, uh, initially under, um, in the spring, we were given a certain amount of money and half of which had to go out to students approximately 3 million of this would also need to be immediately directly given to students, um, which would leave um, about 9 million, um, but it is by college. So one of the challenges we face is that, for example, the Community College of Vermont, because it includes part-time students, uh, Pell eligible students, a large portion of that money is directed to the Community College of Vermont. And they, they haven't really had a lot of COVID expenses because they've been online. 
they're not doing testing, they got an exemption uh, from the administration on that. So uh, one of the questions we have is how much of that remaining money could we actually use? Um, you know, so right now we're estimating between five to $8 million that we may have available to us to use from that. Is that a fair assessment, Sharon? You're gonna, you yeah, might have the numbers so more that, detailed than I do, but. You've done an excellent job. <laughs> okay, so. So that was the money in the spring when we, we got some money in the spring. I think we got about six million, three million of which had to go to students mm -hmm. and three million of which we were able to use to reimburse our room and board. So it's it's similar to that um, funding. Oh, so it, it does come with fairly prescribed uses then. There are fairly prescribed uses. Um, one of the, and we're still studying it, uh, and as you probably know, the federal guidance is um, a little sketchy at this point and not quite as adequate as we'd love it to be. Um, so we're still understanding it, but um, a part of this money or um, we're hoping the majority of it could be potentially used for loss of revenue. Um, and so that's one area that we're really delving into and trying to understand how that could be calculated. Um, again, that is where the Community College of Vermont is a little bit more of a sticking point as it did not see substantial loss of revenue, whereas the other institutions in the system did as it related to the pandemic. Um, so if that is the case, that, that would be helpful. Uh, additionally, um, the restrictions are somewhat similar to CRF. Um, they're not exactly the same, but they're somewhat similar. Uh, so uh, there are quite a few restrictions just as there was with CRF dollars. Hmm. It just seems like um, CCV by design doesn't have the same cost you would have with residential um, facilities and, um, you know, um, that more traditional campus life. Um, okay, so you still, out of the nine million based by college, uh, the great, you said it, CCV would get, how much of that nine million? I think it's around four to five million. Right. Okay. And the rest, okay, so it does, um, yeah, there's a formula that they use. So it's sort of number of students, the number of Pell eligible students you have. This one is distributed a little differently than in the spring because it does give some weight to um, part-time students. So I think that's one of the other reasons why CCV is getting a bigger chunk this time around than last time. Okay. Other questions about that? Hmm. <clears throat> so the, oh, the time yes. frame that this, the new federal money has to be spent is um, is what? One year from the date of receipt. So um, this may be, um, would there be an ability um, um, to, um, instead of using state dollars internally within your budget to supplant those, um, those federal dollars, and move those state dollars to other institutions? Uh, it, uh, can you reframe the question? I'm just wanna oh, make sure I really understand it. Oh, talking about swapping out money, Sharon. Oh, I'm, I'm all for swapping out money. <laughs> it's a question that's- <laughs> That's my question. Can we swap um, out money? That we can absolutely swap out money. The issue for us is that um, HERF money is allocated to a specific institution and it has to be used by that institution. So if the institution is lacking in expenses, um, it would be difficult for us to be able to um, but, make the swap. Sharon, I think what Senator Westman is saying in the July budget, if we just, uh, we budget to the whole system, mm -hmm. how you distribute, could we change it? So um, we adjust to CCV, the amount of the appropriation uh, by the amount that they're getting through this other um, uh, funding mechanism to make uh, that general fund available for it, the- It may uh, be possible. Um, and we're actually working on our appropriations formula uh, okay. right now. So it I, may be possible think, for us to do so. I, I think, did I get your thinking right? Oh, you're, you're headed right in the same way I <laughs> We may have to chat <laughs> later. <laughs> yes, I, um, I wanna keep the system whole. I, and we very much appreciate that. If it's, okay. if it's helpful, I do have the actual amount. So for CCV, the total is 4.4. Um, Castleton is 2.9. Northern Vermont University is 3.4. 
and VTC is uh, 1.7. And the total is around 12.6. I kind of rounded there. So <laughs> if you've written them down and they're a little bit off, that would be why. And CCB was 4.4. 4. 4. 4. Almost 4.5, um, and again, uh, 740,325 would, I believe, would have to go out to students. Um, so anyway, there's, or different amount, yeah, we're trying to figure that piece out. Um, but yeah, it looks like approximately we, we were scheduled to receive around 12.6, 3 million of which would need to go directly to students, which would leave 9.6. And then depending on what happens with the Community College of Vermont would be between between five and eight would be available to us. Okay. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> I, yes, I have Bob? not so much on the money. I'm wondering um, about the nursing uh, programs. Is, is it okay to ask about that? Oh, sure. Uh, that ties into workforce. And uh, to me, that's one of the um, uh, major areas of workforce need that our state college system um, uh, connects to, and that's their nursing uh, programs. Well, yeah, besides being a le legislator, I'm on the VNA board, and <clears throat> we have to hire these traveling nurses that cost us wicked. Uh, the hospitals, they're short people in Newport anyways, and they have to hire traveling nurses. Yesterday, we heard that our own health department hires traveling nurses. So uh, my question is, are we, are we all booked up in the nursing program? And um, could we expand, if we are all booked up, is there any way we can expand that program? Well, we've been pushing that wagon, Senator Starrs. If you look- Yeah, Senator but Westman, we don't seem to move the wagon. Yeah, we're, actually we're there's some initiatives going on uh, in, in the Northeast Kingdom uh, to do just that. And in fact, one of the proposals in the governor's budget is to offer tax um, exemptions for nurses to, um, who um, uh, get their Vermont. education here. Um, that, um, that is a way of creating incentives, uh, but it doesn't do anything to address the underlying problem. And that is there's just an overall shortage of nurses being graduated. And the question becomes one of how can we um, actually increase our, our um, nursing programs to provide sufficient capacity to recognize um, that need, which for the next 20 years is pretty um, staggering, to be honest. And well, my, my, so my, you know, one of the things we're going to have to decide, well, we're, we don't do tax um, policy when you give a income tax exemption, but uh, one of the questions you ultimately you make, is it better to give a tax break to a, a, a nurse that is graduating as opposed to using the equivalent of amount of money to expand the courses, to build the capacity so you can generate a hundred more or how many more yeah. nurses every year for the next 20 years? Well, I know like with us at BNA, it would be cheaper for us to pay a student's tuition and put them through school than it is to hire these, you know, and we do have a program that we've set up there to help. Yeah, and I know, and Senator Sears has said that there's one, um, Bennington Hospital is another. So we actually have a, um, a, a number of programs in place um, by healthcare providers as uh, ways of um, encouraging and meeting their own workforce. But we, but, and that's, that's good. But the question ultimately, because we've been told that um, the programs are, you know, we need to expand them, they're at capacity, and that we have students who want to go into nursing have the academic ability to do so, but the programs um, are, are just um, fully subscribed. So um, that's, that's going to be a, a, a decision that we've, you know, out there, and that is how 
it's the best way if we're making these public investments to get um, um, progress on the fundamental um, challenges. Um, the number of nurses um, it is substantially less than what the, um, uh, the need is. Yeah. So Senator Westman. I would just say, and we've said this before, because this is an old question for us. Um, and uh, I applaud the, the reinvention of um, the way we deliver services at the state colleges. But I would say the legislature is much better at buying things that they can see um, um, with um, revenue. Um, the, so if you had a proposal that said, here's how we could expand the number of nurses that we, um, um, we can put out of the system, I think people in the legislature would move heaven and earth to um, find ways to support that effort financially. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and the fundamental and question is, if you're doing a million and a half in, in tax exemptions, or could that million and a half get us longer term benefit um, if we um, had a proposal to expand the number of, of nurses? Senator and, Sears. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Um, did you want to say, I don't mind, Rich. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would just, I would just say that um, if we could expand the program that Bennington had with um, Southern Vermont that moved to Castleton, I think there are hospitals and um, home health agencies and nursing homes across the state would buy into that big time. I, 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 actually, that's a good segue. I, I'm hoping that Castleton will move into the um, Putnam project in downtown Bennington uh, for the nurses. Although the hospital did just purchase the property of Southern Vermont College. Folks were aware of that. Um, it, it was more in the interest of the community so that it didn't end up as some kind of a who knows what. Oh. Um, so, but I know that they're very interested in working with Castleton specifically. Uh, and I don't know if you've had conversations with Tom D at the hospital. Uh, I, I, I know we, we are looking at, at um, doing that down in Bennington. There's, we've got discussions coming up to see about moving the Castleton nursing program, um, I think to the same building where VTC is and across the street from CCV. So we are exploring ways to- Yeah, that would, that would be the old Putnam block that's under redevelopment. But, you know, given the fact that the hospital is offering to pay back all student loans if you stay five years at the hospital. I think that's a great um, initiative to try to get nurses into more rural areas. And, uh, I hope that the state colleges will work with, Cap with the hospital on this project. I think they actually are doing that, I think in central Vermont, as well as in the Northeast Kingdom with our, our NVRH. And because the hospitals actually have very um, uh, highly um, credentialed um, individuals who would be interested in teaching. They don't wanna move into academia because obviously they're getting paid more working in, in the, for the hospital. But it, the hospitals are now saying they, at least in my area, they would free up um, time. Uh, and actually that the health commissioners routinely are faculty at UVM Medical School um, where they would uh, allow time and they would continue to pay their salaries so that there's not a financial disincentive to actually do some teaching um, uh, uh, to provide um, the credentialed um, staff that you need uh, for a nursing program. So uh, I think some interesting um, uh, discussions are occurring now as to how do we look at our collective resources? How can we address this need? And, um, and so if there are ways that if we had, I guess, I guess I would rather like to support and see how we could make these um, uh, programs and these uh, partnerships and expansion of nursing um, opportunities um, 
um, more um, more available. Uh, to me, there's that's where I'd like to see the money go. Frankly, I'll be honest, because if if the hospital is already paying your tuition and you're coming out debt free, and then we're going to layer on you don't have to pay any income tax. Yeah, it seems I mean, like uh, that's perhaps um, um, that's very well, advantageous financially for the individual, but doesn't do one bit to uh, expand the number. No, I, I would, I, I, if I might, yeah. um, I would just say, um, couple that with the fact that, um, that hospitals, I know that we have staff at Copley that would be willing to teach and have had, uh, had, have taught before one nurse that um, had set up a program. And if you could couple that with staffing in it, it would seem like a win all the way around. So and what's happening? What's happening at our colleges in that regard? Oh, some of this work is underway. So maybe Sophie can brief us on. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, certainly the nursing program is extremely strong at, at Vermont Tech, um, at Castleton, and then at CCV, and we do have these pathways built in. Um, to really encourage, um, you know, em employee people that are interested in going into the medical fields um, to have clear pathways for them. I do know one of the issues is clinical placements for nursing. That can be a bottleneck. Um, is giving people the the hands-on experience that they need, and having um, you know uh, clinical placements available in the hospital. So I know that in the past that's been a challenge, um, but you know we've. We certainly, I know, have you know through through the, the chair um, has raised the issue. I know with the in the northeast kingdom, and we've been following up with Vermont Tech on on that. Uh, Vermont Tech does have um, you know is serving students, nursing students at the Linden campus. Um, so we certainly this is one area I would say where nursing really illustrates collaboration across the system, uh, really involving all of the colleges in moving this forward, but. I mean, I appreciate the comments that have been made and certainly we can think through and I will take Senator Westman's and, and other people's uh, suggestions here in terms of, you know, can we put a proposal together that, that links specifically, you know, if we had X dollars, we could open up X number more seats. Um, so we can certainly, you know, explore that uh, moving forward. Senator Sears, you still have your yellow hand up. Do you have a question or? And you're muted too. Oh, okay. Oh God, I'm muted half the time. I was so happy today that Senator Baruth was muted while he was trying to talk. Because <laughs> I have a hard time with unmuting myself. Um, but if I don't mute, you know, I say things that I didn't intend for anybody to hear. You're it again, Dick. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, other questions um, on the budget adjustment, which is pretty skinny, and then we'll be um, obviously having a lot more discussion as it relates to the 22. Um, and, does, and your proposals, um, I guess I would say the what is being recommended by the governor in the 22 budget than is less than what is uh, suggested necessary <coughs> in that study. Is that correct? That is correct. That, that is correct. <coughs> okay. All right. Can I just ask one final? Yes, you it, may. It's a clarification for me. So <laughs> of the uh, um, nearly 14 million that we um, were around 14 million that we took of CRF money away. Of that money um, was, and at the time we had the stipulation it had to be spent by the end of the year. <coughs> it hadn't have, um, if, if that stipulation hadn't have been there, could you have spent a majority of that 14 million on IT projects? I, I think we, uh, not only IT, but all, I mean, across all the COVID related um, needs, we certainly could have done, yes. And how much of it could you have spent on these things that um, that Senator Bruth brought up are COVID, that are IT related 
that might have an effect on next year's budget? I don't have an exact number on that. I mean, I know that we had, um, we ran into um, supply delivery problems on a lot of the technology. So there was technology that was being ordered, but as everyone in the country was going remote, one of the challenges we had was that we had to take delivery of any equipment by December 31st. And um, that just became, that was one reason why a lot of the money came back was because we couldn't, um, you know, we weren't going to be able to because of the supply chain. Um, so I, I, I can't tell you exactly how much is IT, but I think a, a fairly sizable proportion of that, of the unspent was IT related um, and due to supply chain issues. Okay. I would, I would, I would, I would, I would say, like to um, state for those of us who are on joint fiscal in December, early December, when um, the proposal from the administration was to take that 13 million and bring it back in because it couldn't be spent. And they were going to, they, they put it in as part of their business grant proposal. I had said, uh, perhaps the other alternative is to do like we did with the general fund conversion through public safety or uh, Department of Corrections and preserve that funding for the state college system. I think Senator Westman, you remember that conversation? I do. And Senator Sears and um, uh, the administration um, was holding firm for their 75 million for business grants. And that was part of how they were funding those grants was from that reallocated $13 million. So um, we could have um, used that method, but th that was something that we really couldn't do that well in joint fiscal, uh, couldn't do in joint fiscal, that conversion. And um, the administration was determined to take the 13 million that could be used simply because of the COVID restrictions and uh, use it for a different purpose. So well, just, I did try to- uh, uh, Well, just, uh, just, for, just for anybody that is listening, that might, um, the reminder is um, joint fiscal could only accept or reject proposals from the administration. That's right. And obviously they rejected mine. Well, you well, didn't get we, what you wanted. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that clause in the appropriations bill. No, no, we don't. But <laughs> obviously uh, what you had, it was so many competing needs and, and um, it was unfortunate, but we can't change it. So we're gonna have to deal with it. But if that 13 million had been preserved to carry forward in the general fund um, bucket, um, we would be dealing with a very different situation for FY22. That's yeah. my only point. So um, unless there are further questions or reminiscence about what we could have done and didn't do or tried to do and hit a brick wall, we will let our folks from the state college system get back to work. Yep. Anything else? We, we do have a definite number that they need beyond what's proposed, right? Well, the question for us is we know what the definite number is, but it's for uh, most of it would fall into 22 into the big bill. Yeah. I, can I just ask one question? I'm just sure wondering what, what do the enrollment numbers look like, uh, you know, as compared to a normal year versus now in COVID? That's a, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, we're looking at the spring. I think we've had some softening in numbers of students not coming back in the spring because being, you know, having such a large proportion of classes online isn't what they're interested in doing. It is really challenging for us to predict what we can expect for next year for FY22 for the fall. And that's one reason why, um, you know, right now internally our, our estimates for next year, there's such a large range. Um, because we just don't know if there's, well, we, we don't know what's going to happen with the vaccine, but assuming if we get back to normal, we just don't know if there will, if we'll be able to recapture students that didn't come this year. And we also have to face the fact that we have a much smaller class that came in this year and that smaller class will be with us moving forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just very, very challenging, not just for us, but for everybody in terms of how to predict what's going to happen in the fall. And as we're so 
tuition dependent, it really has a big impact on our ability to um, to do our budgets um, because we, we can't really say with any certainty what it looks like. Um, you, you can find uh, a copy or those numbers in the packet uh, of the enrollment from the fall. So uh, that is available to you there. It was a large drop from our normal uh, pre-pandemic enrollment going into the fall. And unfortunately, that fall enrollment does carry with us for several years to come. As students who choose not to enroll um, tend not to re-enroll or they enroll at slower rates. Um, and so we'll be carrying that incoming class from the fall of 2020 for several more years with us. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? OK. Thank you very much for um, coming today. And I will be talking with you at greater length as we get into the um, big bill. Um, we have. Um, Thank you so much I, for having us. It was a pleasure. And uh -huh. we hope that we can answer any other questions. Yep. OK. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It's uh, at 2.38, according to my other computer, and we have uh, the next witness is scheduled at three. Uh, is it, are you on, Chrissy? You are correct. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, committee, what I thought we would do um, this is going to wrap up all the testimony on the budget adjustment. And then tomorrow, um, have Stephanie start walking through the House is going to bring their budget adjustment bill out onto the floor. Thursday and Friday. Uh, what they did is take our mini CRF bill and um, just put it all into their budget adjustment. So uh, we'll be getting that back, that piece of work that we've already done, um, plus the other parts of the budget adjustment, which I think is going to be fairly straightforward. Um, so that's the only. Um, that was all I wanted to tell you. So do you wanna just take a break um, and come back um, and at three o'clock and then we'll finish our testimony for today? Is yeah. there anything else, Alice? There is just the one thing with regard to the VSNP program. Oh, I've already got the data on that, Alice. Oh, you did, okay. <laughs> 167,000? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I've gotten the emails and I actually asked um, the chair of the house committee um, if they wanted to take a look at that, they had some discussion, but they um, it came in so late that they didn't act on it, but they know that that will probably be something we will put on our, our list for discussion in terms of uh, uh, how that uh, how, how how much revenue has been lost to support uh, uh, the the services. So we have that information and Stephanie has it from of DCF. So yes, Rich. Um, because we all are getting emails about that, can Stephanie or, um, so it's 167? Yeah. It's 167 um, million of revenue that was lost in FY20 because most of the revenue comes in in the spring um, because that's when most people register with the, the dog tags. And so we are looking at also, a, it's not a specific amount yet, but the FY21 number is likely to be very similar. Um, okay. So, you know, 167 would give you balance, would make the fund or, or the program in balance for FY20. But for you FY20. Would, for FY20, but we're in the midst of FY21. So it, you can sort of safely say that you have to double that to, um, or nearly double mm -hmm. that. Did to you cover through 21? Did you say 167 million? Thousand. No, thousand. <laughs> okay. And no, I, I'm going to say a lot of dogs. <laughs> yeah, there wouldn't be a dog or a cat safe in the state. Well, um, okay. Um, so, no, we did get the data uh, of the numbers on that from DCF. And as Stephanie said, um, there are two different pieces, one of which is um, revenues lost from last spring, but that only d deals with a bit of the problem. So um, we're all getting, um, we're getting emails and um, right. we all, we just have to decide what we want to do <laughs> and how much we want to do. Um, yeah. Okay. Anything else other than VSNP? 
which we didn't forget because we already, that's why we got, Stephanie will tell you, <laughs> I emailed her to say, be sure we get the, the figures. Is um, there anything in the, in the budget adjustment that would help the judiciary to get started up on jury trials? No. If not, um, no, Bobby? They should have been saving money all year long to have plenty of money to get started back up with. Okay. I'd, I'd like you to be the special envoy between the Judiciary Committee and Pat Gable to let her know. Well, I think we need to understand the need, Dick, and that's something you can tell help us with, I, I'm sure. I will, I will try to do that. Okay. <laughs> all right. Dick but I, I, would have, I would love to have Bobby be the special envoy. They wouldn't like Bobby at all. Um, all right. Um, so that's something else that we uh, we can have some discussion on as we get into the um, um, into the bill. All right. Um, there may be something in the next round that's available. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, yeah. The, and the question is. Um, mm -hmm. When would they be starting up? When would the need be? And how much should we do in budget adjustment versus um, big bill? Well, I don't know. And we, we need to have a conversation with that. Yeah, we've okay. got a figure. Let me, let me just, there is going to be a huge backlog. And many of us are worried about a huge increase in corrections population as they try to clean up the criminal backlog. Okay. All right. Um, so yep. now we're down to 15 minutes. Okay. We'll go offline. See ya.